Being a detective in New York, if you have a gut feeling, follow it through. You have to work on every aspect of a case. You have to work on your hunches. You have to work on the facts. You have to work on a lot of variables. And in many times, the better detectives work on the hunches. And the hunches generally pan out. I was working days in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. And in comes a gentleman, and he wanted to report his brother was missing. I just haven't seen or heard from him in a couple days, and that's not like him. It's off his, off his beaten path. He's a 48, 49-year-old male. He's got no history of medical problems. He has spoken to his son, who he lives with, and his son said that he was fishing. Now, the NYPD guidelines are clear that if a man's of legal age and he's, and he's not a threat and, he's, and he doesn't need medication, he could disappear if he wanted to. The man's genuine concern kind of prompted me to just make some phone calls. So I make some phone calls to area hospitals, the missing persons unit, a uh, highway unit to see if he got into a, a car accident and he's got amnesia, and nothing came up. So my partner and I go over to his house. Now his house is a absolutely beautiful Brooklyn brownstone. He's owned this house for years. His wife had died and he raised his son by himself. In talking to his son, who seems to be well-dressed, articulate, um, educated. He goes on fishing trips all the time. They can last anywhere from, you know, a couple hours to weeks. He showed me the fishing poles that one's missing off the wall that he had hung, hanging up, and it seemed like a legitimate thing, but there were still some questions raised. That this man would just get up and just go fishing out of the blue like this. A few days later, I'm in the area of that part of Brooklyn again, and I'm, I just figured I'd stop by and I want to interview the tenant in the brownstone, as well as the owners of a bodega around the corner, of which he also owned and collected rent from. And I interviewed these people, and all of them said this gentleman would never go away without telling them. So I go to the apartment again, son answers the door, and I look inside. Now, the apartment's very, very different than when I first went there. The furniture's been rearranged. He's got a couple of people there that just look like they've just got questionable characteristics. This just didn't sit right. But yet the kid kept his demeanor, and he just said, no, my dad's out fishing. As soon as he calls me, I'll have him call you right away. I go back to the station house, and I'm just this gnawing at me. It's going on almost a month that this man's missing, and it just doesn't seem right. My partner and I come up with this, uh, this plan. We get a couple of boxes, and we put in old files into these boxes. On the outside of the boxes, we put this man's name, and we put surveillance photos, miscellaneous documents, telephone records written across the front of the box. We get a photocopy of the block that this man lived on with his son. I call up the son, and I ask him if he would please come down. We would just like to talk to him about it. He goes, sure, sure, and he comes right down. Now, the interview room has a one-way mirror that you can see in, but they can't see out. We sit him in there, and we leave. Now he sees these boxes, and he looks at them. And then he looks at the map on the wall, and he sees that this property is highlighted. And he could see his facial expressions were just priceless. So my partner and I go and sit down and we say, we've been working on this thing for a month. We really haven't, but we tell him that we've been working night and day on this and we find it very strange. And it's basically time for him to fess up. Where is your father? What's going on? You've been lying to us from day one. Now at that point, I'm waiting to hear some story. I would have listened to, we got into an argument, he stormed out. I would have listened to one of my friends did something he shouldn't have done. But all of a sudden he breaks down and he says he killed his father. Hey, Dad, I need some money to go out. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so do I. So he goes through the story that he's been fighting with his father over money. Wait, I get treated like nothing. Like, I'm not even your son. I'm just some charity that you had to give to. I'm not charity. But he feels that he should get a percentage of the, of, of the rental income and that he should, in his will, he should leave him the house. And so now we get a complete statement. That's it. That is the final thing. That is it! There's no more money after this! He beat him over the head. He 
he had him in the bathtub where he cut him up and put him in bags. He gets a buddy of his to help him lug this big bag out and put it in the trunk of the car, where they drove to Far Rockaway, Queens. So we said, let's get in the car and let's go find where you dumped your father. And he takes us down this desolate, high weeds swamp area in Queens. We couldn't find anything that looked like a body had been here or anything like that. He goes, well, maybe it's down the block. We go down the block, no body. So now we have a problem. We've got a guy who gave a full-blown confession of killing his father, cutting up his father's body, and we don't have a body. And if we don't have a body, we have, we have a lot of problems. Nothing. He can ascertain that the confession was forced, that we did something that we shouldn't have done. He would get a lawyer. Bottom line is, we don't have a murder case unless we have a body. We can't find anything. We don't know what to do. So we go to the local precinct, and we go upstairs, we introduce ourselves, we put this guy in the holding cell in the station house. I grab the uh, detectives and I explain the circumstances and what our problem is. So they go rummaging through the files and they say, wait a minute, last month a body was stumbled upon by some kids playing in the weeds, but the body was so badly decomposed, all we could ascertain was it was a male and that's it. They have nothing else because the body was been picked upon by seagulls, local dogs tore it apart. All they had was a, was a pile of decaying flesh and some clothes. We said, that's, that's got to be our guy. So we break out the crime scene photographs of, of his clothes. I guess crime scene had taken pictures of the clothes. They matched the clothes that the son had told us, that he had killed his father, what clothes he was wearing, and that he put all the bloody clothes into the bag. We had the body, we had a full confession, and we found blood underneath the shower rack in the bathtub. And then we ended up getting the guy that helped transport the body. He laid out the story exactly like the son did. It ended up going to trial. I testified at the trial, and he was convicted, and he got sentenced to 25 to life, where he probably is right now. It's one that sticks with you for a long, long time, how a son could actually do this to his father.